Welcome back to the Forensics Detailing Channel. Today we're going to be opening the lid on the can of worms that is paint depth gauges and whether they're a must have or a nice to have. Well, I quit my job down at the car wash and tell my mommy goodbye no. By sundown I've left Kingston with my guitar on the coat. I hitchhiked all the way down to Memphis and got a room in the YMCA. For the next two weeks I went a haunting them nightclubs looking for a place to play. Well, I thought my picking would set them on fire, but nobody wanted to hire a little guitar. Well, I nearly about starved to death down in Memphis. I run out of money and luck. So I bummed me a ride down to Memphis, Georgia, on overloaded boats and truck. I bummed on down to Panama City, started checking out some of them all-night bars. Hoping I could make myself a dollar making music on my guitar. I got the same old story, them all night pins. There ain't no room around here for a guitar man. Welcome back to the channel, guys. So, paint depth gauges. The thing I really want to delve into today on this channel is do you need one? And to answer that question, we really need to sort of talk a little bit about what they're giving you and what they're not giving you. So the first thing before you buy one of these is you need to understand what you're actually measuring and you need to understand the paintwork system typically on an on a everyday car in this generation now um, that you're going to be working on 99% of the time. And that paint system typically will comprise of a panel, you know, a steel panel with like your wings and your bonnets on most cars and then some plastic panels, your bumpers, your skirts a lot of the times and your rear your rear bumper and other bits of the car can sometimes be plastic, like your fuel filler cap and stuff like that. So you've got two types of kind of base material, essentially. I know, I know there's a lot more than two, but typically you'll be dealing with steel panels, ferrous panels, let's say, and non-ferrous panels on your bodywork. Now those panels are painted um, with a paint system, the automotive paint system. Now typically for a ferrous panel, you know, a metal panel, they have an e coat over it to protect that, that, that panel from kind of rust and get exposed to the elements. So if you ever scratch a car down to the metal, one thing you will typically see after it's been outside for, for a few weeks, you know, or a month, is that that panel will start to corrode and rust. Um, so the e coat is there to kind of protect those panels from, you know, and seal them, if you like. Then after the e coat, you have a layer of primer, which is used in all paint systems really even if you're painting wood you can get like wood primers and stuff like that to allow the actual base coat or the color coat to kind of um, lay that on top of the primer it adheres better you key in and flatten out the primer and it give you a better finish stronger finish um, so after your primer you have your color coat your base coat and with automotive kind of water-based paints that they all are now you know, they can be just flat gloss um, base paints or typically metallic fleck in there. You know, and I'm sure there's other ones up there that I'm forgetting. On top of your, ba on top of your base coat, your colour coat, you then have a layer of clear coat or lacquer, which is what really gives the car that glass-like kind of finish and shine, which has made a big difference, you know, since they started using clear coats to, um, to cars. And really, without clear coats, you know, the detailing industry would, would have a lot, um, well, a lot less capability really, because it's working on and refining that clear coat, which really allows you to kind of bring up the finish of your car, you know, a lot of times better than how it came out of the factory. So that is what you're dealing with, with a typical paint system. Ferrous and non-ferrous panels painted. I don't think, obviously, non-ferrous panels, you know, your plastic bumpers, they don't, I believe, have an e-coat. If you ever buy a replacement bumper or anything like that, it just comes as it is, and I believe they're kind of primed in the body shops and painted, so you don't have that e-coat there, I believe. Um, so that is the paint systems. The next thing is we need to talk about how those paint systems are relevant to, to the paint depth gauge that you're likely to be buying. Now the first bit of information about paint depth gauges that you need to know is that the vast majority of the entry level ones at the lower price end, you know, between sort of 80 and 200 pounds, are ferrous paint gauges. So they are able to measure the distance from where you take the measurement, where you put, place them down, to the metal, okay, or to the ferrous panel, and give you an overall reading of the complete paint system between the point where you measure and where the, the actual um, metal is. So you get an overall reading of the entire paint system. Now there are 
very expensive bits of kit out there, like the Positector 200 that you'll pay thousands of pounds for, like ultrasonic ones that are capable of measuring each individual layer. Those particular types of products are not going to be viable for 99.99% for of people wishing to buy a paint depth gauge and really they are going to be for the professional market you know body shops and some professional detailers that are doing a lot of this to a very high standard um, <clears throat> will invest in those particular tools that offer you that you, but the, the most important thing to understand is that all of the or 99 percent of the machines that you are going to be buying you know you're kind of most professional detailers and most hobbyist detailers are measuring the overall paint system depth rather than telling you just how much clear coat you've got so the next thing i want to talk about is how you go about using these devices to get you some meaningful data that's going to actually mitigate some of the risks that that are involved whenever you're removing kind of part of the paint system, the clear coat from cars. And that's effectively what machine polishing is doing. Um, so what are those risks when you're machine polishing? Well, obviously, obviously, whenever you're kind of using an abrasive, there's different levels of abrasive. So um, you can use heavy cutting compounds, light finishing polishes, mid-range cutting compounds, this whole range. But whenever you're doing, whenever you're leaning more towards the aggressive side to do a sort of to take off more clear coat and do heavier correction, then you increase the risks. It goes without saying, because you'll be removing more clear coat. Also, the techniques that you use in terms of tooling and, and um, pad choices and pressure and rotational speeds and stuff like that, they also increase the risks of you going through areas of the clear coat. The biggest risk, really, when you're machine polishing is probably using a rotary with an aggressive kind of pad, maybe a wall pad, but even a foam pad or a microfiber pad, and you are machining at higher speeds with pressure over raised kind of curved edges. Um, you know, typically, typically, if you look at like a bonnet and it curves up perhaps at the edge, that particular edge along there, if you go along that edge with pressure, you can go through the clear coat pretty quickly if you're keeping the machine on there. You know, the, the machine, especially with foam pads as well, they will, when you lay them over a raised point, that raised point is going to really push into the pad and, and the pad's going to work that area with more pressure. You combine that with the fact that there is less paint or clear coat on those ra raised edges, less clear coat falls on them when, when you're spraying it. It makes it very easy to go through those particular areas. Now, paint get depth gauges don't help you particularly with that problem because you can go through those raised edges very, very quickly and you need to be mindful of that. Um, so it's important just to say that. Paint depth gauge is not really gonna help you much with that. What they are really gonna do is they're gonna give you an overall picture of the paint system on your car. And that is gonna highlight to you a few things. The first thing it's gonna highlight is if any areas have been refinished and you can't spot that with your eyes. Now, if you've got the right light and you've been doing this a while, you can spot, more often than not, you can spot shoddy refinishing work with, with different levels of orange peel, colors not matching, tape lines, sanding marks, all that sort of stuff, very easy to spot. Um, but the paint depth gauge will just make it easy so that you, you, know, you can't miss it if perhaps the light isn't there or you're not too sure what you're looking for. Um, even with a good paint job where they've, they've, they've done a good job with the, the colour matching, they've prepped it properly, used good, good materials, laid out good materials, you can still, in most body shops, if you look carefully in the right light when you get it back, you can still find intrusions in those paintwork systems. And, you know, so you can pretty much all the time find when, uh, or you can see when paintwork has been refinished, but it's a lot harder and a slower process to do that by eyeballing. The paint depth gauge will pick it up straight away. If it's a typical sort of buzz off where they've, they've just, they're looking to do a little smart repair perhaps or refinish one panel. And the paint depth gauge will just, you won't be able to miss that. So that's the biggest advantage. It will pick up areas that have been refinished if you're not, not so good at looking for those with your eyes. The second big advantage is, as this machine polishing is becoming more and more popular, and also dealerships using kind of guys to, to refinish these cars on their forecourts in relatively quick, 
you know, short amounts of time because they don't want to pay the money. That's a whole other can of worms we won't go into. It can be a really good idea um, to be able to see if a car has been kind of hit with a machine polisher before. And it's one of the things I look out for when buying a car, especially off dealers. You have to be really careful. I, I just rather that there be scratches on it than, than someone else going in and, and polishing it, even though that's that can sound a bit arrogant, like because I'm sure there's some guys that do very good jobs, but I'd just rather do it myself. Um, so that's the second thing. It's very important and very useful for building up a picture of the the most amount of clear coat you've got over all these readings and the least amount. Now, the the thing that I need to go into on this video is one important thing, and that is you are not necessarily going to know what the the paint system on your car was or should be as it was delivered from the factory. And we're going to talk about that now. So the next thing I need to cover on this channel is what do you do once you've done your survey and how do you kind of interpret those results and use them? So first up, however long you take on the survey, and I would spend at least half an hour doing this. I know you've got, there's a ton of work to do, so you can't always, you know, some guys might take hours doing a paint survey. Um, but typically I'll probably take about 30 readings off of the bonnet um, and that's just kind of plucking it out of the wind. But the bonnet's an important one because it's the bit that tends to get polished most and all those main panels. And then you build up an overall picture of the paint system on your car. And of course the, the, the meters will all give you a typical average. So you could record the average for any one panel and then reset to get the average for, the, for your wing and record that on the layout diagram slightly separately if you're interested in the overall averages. What you'll notice when you first do that, assuming a car hasn't had any major kind of, you know, correction done on it, it's the original paint system, you'll probably notice, like I've got with the 135, that some panels seem to have more paint on them than the others. Now in this example, I've got like about 130 to 140 microns of overall paint system on my bonnet of my car. But the wings and the rest of the car seem to be an average of about 115 down to 105. So straight away, I know I've got more paint system on the bonnet but i don't know that that's necessarily more clear coat it could be could just be that at the factories they were spraying the bonnet separately and a different guy did it and he laid down a little bit more paint or primer or something like that so just because i've got a higher reading generally on the bonnet doesn't even mean i can cut off more clear coat out of that um, but what what you're looking for really is you're looking to get an idea of what the, the high points are on a particular panel and what the low points are. And then when you've got all that information in front of you, if you suddenly see a really low reading in any particular particular area, so let's take the bonnet for example, I'm roughly looking at 130 to 140 microns as what I'm getting as my average readings. If I suddenly go to one particular part of that panel, and that's why it's important to take a lot of readings, and I'm getting a reading of 80 or 90, then that's an alarm bell, okay? Because the, the, the level shouldn't be that low and it indicates that perhaps, um, you know, either at the factory or at the dealership or somewhere, um, some work has been done on that car, perhaps a little bit of um, spot correction, you know, taking out a dirt speck or something like that, some wet sanding and some polishing, and I have less paint system on that particular area. And that is one of the things the most important things that you are looking for when you survey the car, any readings that are unusually low. Now, if all your average readings are 100 and you've got a reading of, say, 90, then that's not as worrying as if you've got readings of 150 all around the car and then suddenly one reading of 90 in a particular area because that would mean there's a 60 kind of micron differential. So you could be very low on clear coat there, potentially, you know. Um, again, it, because it's measuring the overall paint system, you can never be 100% sure. And this is really important. This is all the sort of limitations. But you can infer that perhaps some spot correction has been done there and you need to be careful. And that is where these machines come in very, very handy. Okay, so that could save you potentially. You could have, you know, as little as five microns on that particular part of the car. And if you go in machining it with heavy cutting compounds on a rotary and stuff, you could go through that or you could leave yourself with, you know, one micron of clear coat at the point where it's just gonna fail, you know, um, very, very quickly or relatively quickly. So this is the stuff that is, the, you know, this is the 
critical part of using these basic paint depth gauges to build up an overall picture of your paintwork. Now, the alternative to low an overall low readings is ridiculously high readings. Now I've said before, or I might have said before, I can't remember, I do so many takes of these things, I can't remember where I've been. But if you get high readings, so say you're going around this car and suddenly you get a reading of like, you know, 300 microns on one particular part, and that's twice as thick as the, the, the OEM paint system that's been given, then, then typically that area is gonna be refinished. Now, um, you can spot refinishing most of the time. You know, a shoddy, shoddy bit of paintwork sticks out like a sore thumb under the right light and you can see, you know, you can usually see a difference in the orange peel. Sometimes you can see a difference in the color match. Sometimes you can see tape lines, which you shouldn't get. You know, sometimes you can see the, the sanding marks and the kind of buffer trails where they've not really delivered you a finished kind of product. It goes on all the time, you know, and it's a can of worms to talk about, but you know, it goes on all the time, the paint shops, um, there's good ones and there's bad ones, like anything. Um, so, the, but the the main point is the paint depth gauge will pick up straight away. You know, on a, on the ferrous components where you can use it. Um, now, sometimes you get good paint paint jobs that are done, um, and you can't spot spot them from anything obvious, like the blending kind of where they blended it in, or the orange peel levels, or the color matches spot on. Even under heavy light though, you can usually spot something that's been refinished because it usually, in most body shops, it will usually have more intrusions in the paintwork, you know, and that, a lot of times that's underneath the clear coat, those intrusions, there's not much you can do about them. Sometimes they're in the, in the clear coat, you know, sort of dust specks on the top layer where they ha they've just painted it and given, you, given it back to you, you know, which goes on as well. Um, but again, that, that's harder to spot, you know, with a good paint job. And the paint depth gauge, again, will, will typically alert you to stuff like that a lot easier. Um, the next problem is, though, that if you even if you've spotted an area that has been refinished and you've got a very high reading, again, you've got no idea really how much clear coat you've got on that, on that um, particular area. But it alerts you to the fact there's a problem, and then you can be mindful when you're working on that particular area. Typically, if it's refinished, typically, there's a hell of a lot more clear coat on there than, than, than the OEM process, but not always, so you know, and sometimes that clear coat they use in body shops can be soft as butter, um, and sometimes it can be good quality and, and hard. So th this could all go, this can all introduce kind of complexity when you're doing this, this survey, but the main point to using these paint depth gauges is to give you an overall idea of the levels of paint on your car. Now the big, the big thing is obviously that the entry level ones cannot measure plastic or non-ferrous surfaces. So you can argue if you're none the wiser on your bumpers, you know, your front bumpers and your skirts and stuff like that, then you're running the same risks as someone who has just polished the car without a paint depth gauge. Um, well, the answer to that is not, not entirely because they'll have been given, the people that have done the survey on the car will have an overall pattern or an idea of what's gone on history-wise with the paintwork on the, on the ferrous kind of panels. And that might give you an indication, if you've spotted, for example, that you've got, that the machine, the car has definitely got low clear coat from some significantly kind of lower average um, readings on any one individual panel, then you might be able to infer that the um, plastic panels have also been machined and be more mindful of that. Okay, so now you're at the stage where you've gone ahead and done your paint survey of the car and hopefully it won't have highlighted any problem and you'll have reasonably consistent, healthy readings. You know, this is another can of worm subject. What is a healthy reading? Because the amount of clear coat you've got and the hardness of that clear coat varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Very new modern cars now I hear are using, you know, can be laying down one layer of very thin clear coat now in the factory so you can have these very low readings on new cars. I've not seen that yet. You know, typically I'm used to kind of working on not brand new cars, you know. This M135 is a kind of classic example of 130 to 140 microns of paint um, or, you know, a little bit less on the side panels. That's kind of typical. And I know I've still got a fair amount to play with on this car. 
So the next can of worms subject that we need to go into is how much clear coat you should be taking off. Now I just, this can get very, this can go all over the place, this one, eh? can of worms alert. <laughs> um, now let's just assume that we've got 30 microns of clear coat to work over the entire car, okay? A lovely, lovely, nice assumption to work to. It'd be nice if it was like that all the time. Now some guys will tell you that you shouldn't take off any clear coat off cars and they're typically not in the detailing trade or you know machine polishing f trade and I don't agree with that because I've been polishing cars for years and I've never prematurely caused the paint system on the cars to fail. I don't typically dig that deep when I'm doing it. Um, I, don't, I won't use heavy correction compounds all the time unless I need to and the results are there to be seen and it's amazing. You can transform cars. So I don't buy this, don't touch clear coat on cars at all. Um, you know, I, I, that, yes, enough said, I don't buy that. Some guys will say never, never really go below halfway, 50%, you know, don't take off 50% of the paintwork system. I've heard some say don't take off 75%. Um, I've heard people saying that you shouldn't, shouldn't, you know, that all the UV protection is in the top area of, of the clear coat system. So you shouldn't really be going through that. You know, you should avoid wet sanding and stuff like that. Now that, my opinion on that is that it depends on the manufacturer. You know, I've got a couple of friends that work, you know, Reg works for a manufacturer and I've spoken to a couple of other guys that, that I've made contact through through doing the channel that, that work or have worked at, at car manufacturing places where they're spraying these. And the methods they use and the products they use and the approach is different from manufacturer to manufacturer. I'm sure it may well be the case that there are manufacturers that are laying a specific base coat like clear coat down um, that may not be high in kind of the UV filters and then they're using like specific products of top coat clear coat that may be higher in the UV filters and harder. You know, I, I'm sure that does go on. Um, but I also know that some manufacturers will lay down two layers of clear coat with exactly the same product and there's no difference in that clear coat in terms of the amount of the UV filters that are in there throughout that system. So, you know, are there guys out there that understand that, you know, and if they're working on a certain year of car and age, they know that they shouldn't go too deep because of UV, stripping out the UV protection. I don't know. That goes beyond... That goes beyond my knowledge of these paint systems, okay? My general rule is on how much paintwork I should take off of the car, based on the, the I've got 30 microns model, because it just takes out a few minefields if you're working on that model. My, my um, thoughts on that is it's the least possible for, for what's gonna benefit the kind of look of the car and what you're trying to achieve and how much damage you're trying to cut out. If you've got a heavily kind of a really old car, you know, the older the cars are and the more kind of scratches they've built up after generations of kind of installing these scratches, it's typically like a layer of an onion. And you need to peel off a fair amount of it to bring the finish back. Um, but you shouldn't, or there's risks around trying to aim for perfection. That's the trap that you need to fall, avoid falling into. And sometimes, you know, you might do two compounding sets on a car that's typically cutting away a fair old amount of, of paintwork potentially. Um, or, you know, you could get tempted into chasing perfection and chasing out indiv individual scratches where you are actually removing significant chunks of the paintwork. And I could talk about that for, for long enough and, and people could argue different cases with me and, and they, there wouldn't be a right or wrong. It would just be a big can of worms based on experience, opinion, and, and what you're trying to achieve. So. The main reason it's relevant to this discussion though is because that the paint depth gauge makes you more aware of all of this than you would be if you were working without it. So, you know, I fired up this, this video to do, I made some bullet point notes and I wanted to talk about some of the things that I thought were interesting to get a discussion going in the comments. The title of this video was the paint depth gauge must have or nice to have. Well, the answer lies somewhere in between. The, the, my thoughts on it are, if you are doing this, this particular type of work, even if you're doing it as a hobby at home, the paint depth gauge doesn't really fall into category of must have or nice to have. It, it's better described as if you can budget one, if you have enough 
um, money to go and buy one because I mean, I think most people can afford this. This DTM 156 that I'm using is about between 80 to 90 quid. And I'll probably do a separate review of it and I'll stick a link for the description in it because it's like the first cheap one that's half decent, but I'll do a full review of it on the channel. But going back to the point is it's best described that if you can budget for one of these, you should really go ahead and buy it and you should use it every time you machine polish without doubt because it will give you information that it's very difficult, you can't infer without it. <coughs> now, going back to this thing about budget and can you afford one and should you afford one? It's easy to say everyone can afford 80 to 90 quid. They probably can. The thing with detailing is there is a million and one bits of kit that you could argue are must have and nice to have or you should have if you can afford them. And you can fast end up you know, with a garage full of various bits of kit. And there's always limitations on how much money people want to spend depending on how much you're into all this. But like I say, my advice is if you're machining, um, you know, doing a fair amount of machine polishing on your car, maybe friends and family's car, other people's cars, you know, a lot of guys that do it at home, do it for mates and stuff like that, or do it as a sideline, you should really have one. You can survive without them, I did. Do not go and buy the real cheap ones that are like 10, 15 quid on eBay, because that's what I had. They break very quickly, and I don't believe they're, they're as accurate as this DTM 156, which is like the entry level one. You calibrate that yourself. The calibration is very important, but it gives you an idea. Once you've done your calibrations and adjusted it so that the test plates are measuring what they should do, um, you'll get a re relatively rough, roughly accurate reading to around about one micron which is accurate enough how you use the tool as well you, you want to make sure that when you push it down it sits f flat on the ring and you use a consistent pressure a bit like using the gloss meter so you take accurate readings with it okay guys so i hope this was useful it was really kind of like a high level discussion around paint depth gauges and it is all about really giving you a little bit of information about how useful they are to you, what they're providing you, what they're not providing with you. Yes, you can you can machine polish a car without them, of course you can, um, um, but what we've hopefully tried to tackle in this video is that it's better to have one than not have one ideally. Okay guys, so that is the can of worms, the paint depth gauge um, subject kind of ticked off and talked about. I hope it was useful. Let me know if you're kind of a guy at home that does a fair bit of this and you're you're sort of toying with the idea of getting one, um, what your thoughts are on the whole thing. Let me know if you're professional. I mean, most professional detailers will have, you know, at least the basic um, ferrous kind of um, paint depth gauge. Um, and I'm sure the professionals will probably be leaning more towards saying yeah, you, you really probably do need to have this. Um, whereas the guys at home, I'm sure lots of them don't. You know, I survived with years without one. And the first one I bought, don't buy the cheap eBay ones that cost like 10 or 20 quid because they are unreliable, nowhere near as accurate and they'll break on you um, very, very quickly. That's my, that's my only experience really on paint depth gauges before getting the DT156. This is a hell of a lot better as well. So um, yeah, hopefully we can get a good discussion going in the comments as always on your thoughts on this whole um, subject of paint depth gauges. So thanks very much for watching guys and I will see you soon on the Forensics Detailing channel. Bye for now. Get on out to the club called Jackson. You got a little time to kill. Just follow that crowd of